टुडे वी आर टेकिंग अप एटीन सेंचुरी लिटरेचर एंड हैविंग अ लुक एट द बुक्स एंड द ऑथर्स एंड सम ऑफ द सोशल कंडीशन ऑफ द एज ना अबाउट द एटीन सेंचुरी इफ आई वुड टेल यू द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग वुड बी दैट इट वॉज अ ग्रेट पीरियड फॉर इंग्लिश प्रोज दो नॉट फॉर इंग्लिश पोइट्री न मैथ्यू आर्नट कॉल्ड इट एन एज ऑफ प्रोज एंड रीजन मीनिंग दैट नो गुड पोएट्री वॉज रिटन इन दिस सेंचुरी एंड दैट प्रोज डोमिनेटेड द लिटररी वर्ल्ड it is known for the large number of brilliant prose writers that it threw up the prose of this age was simple and modern practicality and reason ruled supreme in prose and determined its style the language of prose was becoming simpler and more easily comprehensible while the language of poetry was becoming very artificial at this time much of the 18th century prose is taken up by topical journalistic issues a really huge mass of pamphlets journals booklets and magazines were written there were literary critics economists letter writers essayists politicians public speakers divines philosophers historians scientists biographers and public projectors which tells us that indeed this was an age of prose and reason The novel and the periodical paper are the two gifts of the century to English literature and some of the best prose of the age is to be found in its novels and periodical essays. Matthew Arnold had to call the 18th century our excellent and indispensable 18th century because we cannot imagine English literature without the 18th century. Now let's look at the social conditions of the 18th century. The first half of the 18th century saw the furious raging of the deistic controversy. The deists including Charles Blount, John Tollent, Matthew Tyndall, Anthony Collins and the Earl of Shaftesbury believed in what they called natural religion that is belief in god without corresponding belief in christianity or as a matter of fact any religion. Swift was one of those who controverted the deistic heresy. The rise of methodism was another theological feature of the century. The two Wesley brothers, John and Charles, were the initiators of the new move towards importing the old enthusiasm, simplicity and sincerity into the religion of the day. John Wesley's prose is characterized by directness, simplicity and a rude compelling force. Now if we look at the writers of this age one by one Number 1 we are taking up Daniel Defoe who uh, was perhaps the most copious writer of the 18th century he is best known for his Robinson Crusoe and some other works of fiction like Moll Flanders and Roxana his non fictive prose consists of a large number of pamphlets generally published anonymously meaning he never wrote his no name on them and a staggering bulk of miscellaneous writings mostly topical in nature he started a triweekly periodical called the review in 1704 which continued up to 1713 in it he dealt with political religious and commercial matters there is not much of the universal in his non fictive prose to keep it alive but one just wonders at the sheer number of his works which total about 500 Now the next author we take up is John Arbuthnot. Arbuthnot was a man estimable for his learning, amiable for his life and venerable for his piety. He was a close associate of Swift and Pope and was by profession a physician. His History of John Bull published in 1712 was an allegorical satire and in the words of Legui in a short history of english literature it remains one of the most famous political satires england has produced therein is described the legal battle between john bull which st- who stands for england and nick frog that is holland on the one side and louis baboon that is france and lord strutt that is spain on the other side arbuthnot upholds evidently the tory point of view favoring the termination of hostilities then raging between the countries mentioned above he manifests an easy mastery of lucid and vivid style as also delightful strokes of irony which made swift complain arbuthnot is no more my friend he dares to irony pretend 
Next we take up Jonathan Swift. Swift was the greatest prose satirist of England. He dominated the first half of the 18th century. Some of his satires are obscene, misanthropic and cynical, but none can question his moral integrity. Swift's satire is all embracing. Swift's sensitiveness to corruption, numerous frustrations which punctuated the entire span of his life and the egregious folly, corruption and self-seeking which he found tainting the age of reason and good sense prompted him to take up his lash the age deserved satire and his personal disposition and disappointments made him keen enough to give it edison perfected the periodical essay which was invented by steel with the tatler in 1709 Edison collaborated with Steele as Steele did with him in the Spectator which was launched by Edison in 1711 after the Tatler had been wound up the periodical paper was extremely suited to the temper and conditions of the 18th century and that explains its immense popularity the genius of Edison was also quite happy with this new literary genre now if you look at the philosophers and theologians that the 18th century threw up it was george berkeley and david hume who were the great philosophers of the 18th century as hopes and locke were of the 17th century berkeley was an upholder of absolute idealism and as such went so far as to deny the very existence of matter his deep religious convictions had the color of mysticism as regards the clarity of berkeley's prose style legway observes nothing could be more admirable than the lucid prose perfectly simple and perfectly elegant in which berkeley expressed his profound and subtle views hume was by far the greatest philosopher of his age his approach is marked by skepticism and utilitarianism regarding his style legway says nothing could be more tranquil and assured than the march of his thought nothing clearer than the prose in which he pursued his most subtle analysis in lucid and sober language adam smith was the father of political economy his wealth of nations written in 1776 enjoyed a long and undisputed reign as the bible of political economists his style is precise and unadorned to the extent of being altogether uninteresting we may say next dr johnson as a prose writer dr johnson is particularly known for his dictionary his periodical papers his philosophical tale rasselas and his critical work lives of the poets as a critic he made many errors but his infectious sanity cannot be ignored as a prose stylist he was a purist however his style though vigorous and direct is somewhat heavy handed and as such is sometimes derisively called johnsonese which chambers dictionary defines as johnsonian style idiom diction or an imitation of it ponderous english full of antithesis balanced triads and words of classical origin goldsmith said jokingly about johnson's style that it may fit the mouth of whales but it certainly does not fit the mouth of little fish among the biographers and letter writers the 18th century produced many of them they were biographers autobiographers and writers of semi public letters james boswell the biographer of his idol dr johnson has the pride of place among them his work is as massive as the great johnson himself life of johnson is a unique work of its kind written by boswell boswell's devotion to dr johnson became the cause of his own fame among the autobiographers may be mentioned gibbon lord hervé and john wesley Lady Mary Wortley Montagu Cooper Chesterfield Gilbert White Gray and Horace Walpole were some of the famous letter writers of the 18th century Goldsmith had started the Spectator papers there was a remarkable increase in periodical literature at that time to name all the periodical papers which appeared in the 18th century will be an uphill task but most of them continued the tradition set by edison and steel with their own papers the name of oliver goldsmith is associated with numerous periodical papers his cosmopolitan attitude tolerance delicacy and sentiment are his hallmarks as an essayist he expresses himself in a chaste and elegant style free from artificial devices among the historians if we see the respectable place and highly uh, venerable 
place or name goes to Gibbon who had written the monumental work The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. It was the greatest of the his he was supposed to be the greatest among the historiographers of the age his attitude is entirely rational and antimystical his style is dignified and somewhat ponderous but he can effectively combine harmony and majesty with logic and precision edmund burke was the greatest orator of the age he dealt with the pressing political problems facing the british empire his works concerning indian and american affairs and the french revolution are written in brilliant and rhetorical prose which cannot but impress the most indifferent reader or listener he was an anti theorist who recommended action in keeping with the spirit and complexion of the times Now there was a lot of political literature also being written at this time. Now if you look at the events it was the expiry of the licensing act in 1695 halted state censorship of the press. During the next 20 years there were to be 10 general elections. These two factors combined to produce an enormous growth in the publication of political literature. Senior politicians especially Robert Halle saw the potential importance of the pamphleteer in wooing the support of a wavering electorate and numberless hack writers produced copy for the presses. Richard Talents also played their part. Harley for instance instigated Daniel Defoe's interesting work on the review which consisted in essence of a regular political essay defending if often by indirection current government policy. He also secured Jonathan Swift's polemical skills for contribution to the Examiner. Swift's most ambitious intervention in the paper war, again overseen by Harley, was the conduct of the Allies, a devastatingly lucid argument against any further prolongation of the war of the Spanish succession. Writers such as Defoe and Swift did not confine themselves to straightforward discursive techniques in their pamphleteering. but experimented deftly with mock forms and invented persona to carry the attack home both writers made sometimes mischievous use of anonymity that was conventional at that time according to contemporary testimony one of defoe's anonymous works the shortest way with the dissenters written in 1702 so brilliantly sustained its impersonation of a high church extremist its supposed narrator that it was at first mistaken for the real thing Anonymity was to be an important creative resource for Defoe in his novels and for Swift in his prose satires. Now if you have any questions based on the 18th century uh, prose you may put it in the segment below and I shall do my best to answer them. Thank you.